Right. I never, I've never done that before. Oh. So I've never done that countdown and pointed. <laughs> I've just caught myself on the camera as well. <laughs> uh, do you know who started that? What an idiot. No, I just hit record. I say, hey, I'm recording by now. I'll give you a countdown. There was someone in your leasing studio last week and they were, they were doing the countdown. They're all professional. Five, four, three, <laughs> oh, I said flipping out. I don't do that. <laughs> Excellent. I'm, the, I'm your guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lizzie Stileman MB, absolute pleasure to have you in the studio. We've been trying to organise this for ages, haven't we? Yeah, probably almost a year now. Yeah, uh, but uh, we were talking actually in the car park. Hectic lifestyles. Yeah. Craziness going on. Difficult to align calendars, diaries, but I'm chuffed we've done it. And on that note of calendars, diaries, and loads of stuff going on, react at the moment. Yeah. Lots of change going on. Yeah. Unbelievable last 18 months. Unbelievable, Unbelievable. last 18 months. So you were saying Op React is yes. now what is now coming to an end. Yeah. So Op React finished last Friday. So whatever, it's the 21st today. So what, the 19th? Yeah, something like that. So 18th. 18th mm-hmm. There we go. Uh, so it finished on the 18th. So that was it. Op React started for me on the 22nd <coughs> of March 2020 when I got called in to uh, Chilmark headquarters. But the actual op itself started about a week later because I was just plugged into the military as a liaison officer. And, but the, the official op started a week later. So, yeah, it's, it's gone on since middle of March 2020 until middle of June 21. It's ridiculous. You know, the charity is only meant to do one, two, three-week deployments at a time. And has just been, it's just been outstanding what it's done. What was the size of the volunteer base at the start of React? Okay, so that's a really interesting question. I think we had about 500 volunteers on our books at the start. So they're the trained volunteers that we had. Um, Not everyone would have been um, uh, keeping uh, keeping with us. So at the 500, I don't know what percentage of that uh, were engaged with us. And that was right at the start. And, you know, then React said, right, let's reach out to the veteran volunteers. And so put a call out on all forms of media. If you're a veteran, you know, sign up here and do some good. And, you know, we had nine and a half thousand people reach out and come and join us. Now, again, not all were engaged and we didn't use everyone that put their hands up. But it's incredible what we, we achieved um, with with very, very little money behind it 15 full-time members of of staff and that was it 15 members of staff who drove this thing and have been driving it you know since march last year absolutely phenomenal wow isn't it (laughs) unbelievable unbelievable that's why i asked i I wasn't sure how many you asked had the start i but i knew at one point uh, there's an eight thousand eight thousand figure in my head it was at one point i remember maybe it was sharpie or maybe paul taylor had said to me um yeah we're eight thousand volunteers now yeah and that's what I was thinking, what do they have at the start? And I didn't think it was as low as five. Yeah. I say low, five hundred is not low, right? Yeah. Especially for a, uh, what is predominantly an international disaster response yeah. organisation. But uh, that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I'd shout to the nine half thousand people who flipping put their hands I up know. as well. Because I, I ended up with a couple of tasks and I met some of them. And these people, you know, <sighs> arguably would never have volunteered for anything like what React disaster response is if it wasn't a pandemic. Mm. And arguably would not probably not in the best position in their lives as many of us were during the p- pandemic going on. But regardless, volunteer to go and do what is difficult work. Difficult work, either mentally and physically or or physically and or both. Mm. You know. Um and uh, and from all walks of life. I really I I only I only got to just go on two I think two tasks with during the pandemic with React. Okay. But it was a privilege because you get to see these all, all yeah. manner of people. It all it, every single demographic you think yeah. of all coming together to help uh, work the task I was on was you know NHS help, yeah. help the NHS in different ways. Um, talk to me about the um, that military role you were playing there, the military liaison. Yeah, so um, I did twenty years regular service for the army and got out in twenty fifteen and joined the reserves. Um, <coughs> my reserve role is with the National Reserves headquarters based in Woolwich, and they sort of farm you out to different headquarters. So although I'm with the NRHQ. My my sort of uh, where I'm based is Standing Joint Command in Aldershot SJC, and that's where the pandemic was run from. So when React called me and said, 
you know, are you putting your hand up for volunteering? I said, yeah, of course, thinking it'd be a, th actually, they told me it'd be a three weeks, you know. <laughs> um, so they, they said, look, can you be a liaison officer with the military? And I said, you do realize I'm normally paid for this role, don't you, going into SJC? But it made absolute sense <coughs> because they knew me in old shot. They knew um, I, I'd been there loads of times. I'd actually been there when Hurricane Dorian had hit back in September 19. And um, I, I was meant to be doing a week with SJC and they and I had to drop everything and run um, because of Hurricane Dorian. So I got deployed um, to the Bahamas. And then I went back in the December of 2019 and gave them a presentation on what I'd been up to. So they knew me and they knew about React and they knew, you know, that I this is what I do. So um, Nick Parker, the chair, made some contacts um, with, you know, the high level military um, and I knew other people within the military and SJC. So I got invited in and saying, look, can you coordinate the voluntary sector with the military? And I can talk the language because I can talk the military talk, but I'm there very much in a voluntary role. So I was there very much there in a hoodie, not in uniform. And so I, w I could just link um, the military with the voluntary sector, not just react, but, you know, plugging in and, and sort of putting the, the whole force forward. So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's, everyone was responding. It wasn't just the military. No one knew what was happening. This is, you know, all brand new for everyone. So it was very much not quite sure what my task was when I got to SJC, but it was sort of make it up as you go along. And putting that, um, that forward leaning uh, liaison in every part of the, the UK. Um, and we had contacts in all our React staff were out there. And I was trying to get them work and, um, you know, seeing what the military were turning down and what they were accepting and just liaising between the two. And that was really what I was doing. So is, is that what the regional coordinators were doing was working to you on those tasks? Not to me. I, okay. I was just plugging in and keeping my ear to the ground. So I was always okay. pushing everything back to Ben yep. and Paul in the headquarters. And, you know, absolutely weren't working to me at all. We were all one big team and I, I was just feeding extra information in. Yeah, I think I, I think I phrased that badly. Yeah. I, I think it meant, yeah, you, you, the, the tasks are falling out. Yeah. Were, yeah, so a really good example of that is the mortuary task in Breakspear. So the military didn't want to do it uh, for a number of reasons. And it sort of came in as this request, which wasn't accepted. And I remember saying to Rich Sharp, you know, we've got this, you know, in working in a, a mortuary. And I have to say, I was thinking, I wouldn't want to do that. Um I have to say the volunteers were incredible and the mortuary staff was saying that, you know, this is as good as you get. You, you know, they, they were so professional, our volunteers. And actually they had um, people taking over from us were um, event putting up um, marquees and festivals and they took over from us and they weren't respectful. They weren't, you know, our volunteers were 10 times better than them and they were getting paid. Oh. And so it was a really big thing that we did amazing tasks that we couldn't sing and shout about that we'd done this incredible thing because it wasn't the sort of thing you want to say, yeah, we're doing hot trees, you know, it's not something you publicize, but we absolutely, you know, the volunteers were incredible and a huge amount of dignity uh, with the deceased, just absolutely mind blowing what they got up to there. What what's the where did the need come from for that? Can you elaborate? On um, that? From what I see, it was just more deaths coming in than, than any mortuary could could deal with, and staff going off sick and so on and so forth, and and so there was a need to manage the bodies, and that's what our our guys and girls were doing. Just incredible, and they were you know knowing where they all they were, they were calling by their names, and they were really really respectful and really emotional task. And sometimes, you know, this is right at the start of the pandemic. We didn't know what the um, infection was like and you know, the PPE wasn't great then probably. And I know they were dealing with bodies that were coming out of bags. So it was absolutely incredible what they achieved. How long did, the, how long did that, those kind of tasks carry on for? That, that went on right through the last year, didn't it? Yeah, there were different, different mortuaries that they worked on. So I don't know. I don't know to be honest. Uh, so the task we get going, okay. and then we have different strike team leaders in there, loads and loads of veteran volunteers, not just trained responders, and it's just absolutely incredible. It just blew my mind what they could do. Hmm. 
Yeah. Mm, incredible work. Mm. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be doing that. Mm. Um, how did the uh, how did React's uh, relationship with government, military, local mm. government uh, change over the course of the pandemic? Did it did it because it increased in positive in a positive way in yeah. a lot of places, didn't it? Was well, that across the board? Yeah. Well, we we were really unknown. You know, really tiny charity built based in Wiltshire. Um, no one really knew who we were. So the SJC knew who I was and they knew what I'd been up to, some of the people in there. And then I was sort of hanging around, you know, it, that I was there every day. So they all knew who I was and that was the voluntary sector point of contact. With government, it was slightly different. We, had, we, would do it, we did some work uh, for them. And I know that um, Ben Lampard and, and the team did some work before, just before the pandemic, just sort of planning how a response could happen. Um, but the relationship, um, I know that, that the, in, the, in the local authorities, every authority is different. And, you know, so some, the relationship's quite strong and some it's not so. And then you've got local resilience forums. And again, we've built up some really amazing relationships in some areas and it's harder to crack in others. So it's very hard to say, you know, some areas are absolutely amazing. And I know we're sticking with a few now to try and build and increase on that relationship to, to build in resilience for the future. Because let's face it, you know, there's, there's always going to be something happening, whether it's a flood or whatever it is. And if we can be prepared to, to launch and have the relationships before the, the event happens, that's, you know, that's the gold option. Mm. With, uh, with that forward look at mm. what's happening now, are you, are you talking about the people, the, there's a week off going on yeah. the mark. There's a bit of a reset going on. Yeah, there is. So the the op react finished on Friday. The staff are taking a, a massively well deserved week off, and to reset. We've got a new CEO coming in, and that that he or she is yet to be selected, and that's going to be happening over the next four or five weeks, which is really exciting. Um, we are looking at moving from Chilmark. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts at the moment, but what we're going to be doing is resetting. So we've got 9,000 veteran volunteers of which s some don't know how many want to come and join us fantastically, but we have to train them up. So training starting again, as soon as, um, you know, staff are back and the training, you know, and so that there's a lot of moving parts at the moment, really getting training back on, on, on track is really important because we, we don't want to take people at risk. We need to get there, make sure they're the right sort of person. There's a lot of taking at risk during COVID. Um, you know, you, you, you're just saying because you're a veteran, what will take you on? But we need to make sure that, that they're properly trained and that that's the next thing. And international training will need to start as well because we've now started hurricane season again for the Caribbean. So hurricane season starts you know, June till December notoriously it comes along September, October and thankfully last year there wasn't a big one that we you know that that, that, that needed our response. And you hope there's not gonna be one this year, but you've got to be ready for it. What about um the the core of React, those the you know, the, the core staff. Yeah. Are they looking at expanding to get to meet the needs in the future or? Yeah, I mean they they're, they're always looking at how we can improve what we've got we've always got to keep an eye on finances that is because you're a charity and if you don't have the money you can't pay the staff and you need to have a runway ahead of you that, that you're able to you know you you've got you've got a burn rate staff costs um that the rental of the building the heating and all you know all the um insurance and w which is significant so you have to work out how much money you've got and we've got our sister um um, business now resilient which is earning us money um, and we're trying to get that to throw money across to react every month to to help with the charity and we need to be in a good financial place talk to me about resilience because in all honesty that I, I forgot about that actually mm. talk about that because that's right yeah. back, i'll shut up you yeah no it. so um <laughs> it was born on the back of of covid testing and there's a company called signpost who um said look would you like to come on board and earn some money out of testing so we put a team together and they are paid so they're not volunteers <coughs> they're paid people and they they get they, so they were doing covid testing mainly for babcock initially and and it was earning us money that we could then 
put into the, the charity pot, you know, React's charity pot. So it was it was kept us afloat because, you know, people want money for charities was really going downhill over the last sort of fifteen months. So that was quite amazing. So we're now looking at exactly what Resilient can do, making sure it's in line with React because we don't want it to suddenly go and get children to sell arms for us and you know that but but you've got to keep it very very much on track and make sure that that they're within our you know our, our mission and and what we believe in um so there's a lot of thought going on at the moment how it's all going to be structured how it sits properly um making sure that the charities commission are happy making sure legally we're all happy and sort of the, the money's able to come in so there's a lot of restructuring going on and there's a development committee uh, looking at that at the moment. Mm, interesting. Mm. Could, from, from my understanding, it was a, some you know some form of training, consultancy, resili resilience training for yep. corporates and yep. stuff, which yep. is a massive scope for us. Massive, yeah. And so, hopefully, resilient will take on our training, the React's training, so they can use that training to you know get get companies and corporations to, to you know to do the same training, but it'll also be training our, our responders. Mm -hmm. How did you? Get involved with it, with so React. With React, when so because you, you deployed pretty much almost yeah immediately yeah. after being pulled into the fold. Right? I did, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did a masters in twenty. I left the army twenty fifteen. <coughs> signed up to a masters um, in disaster management in I think September fifteen. Um, graduated sort of the end of middle of uh, 2016, so about September 2016, and I was talking to Bournemouth University, the Disaster Management Centre there, and they said they wanted to employ me, but I had to get my hands dirty, and I had to very much um, you know, understand what it's like at the grassroots level doing disaster management. And they said, look, there's an organisation, then was called Team Rubicon, and it's ex-military. I think you'd be perfect for it. So I signed up in January 2017, did the induction couple of days and within uh, two weeks I think I was out in Nepal um got back from that did a course in Chilmark and then next thing I know there's floods in uh Sri Lanka so I went out of running the op in Sri Lanka um which was you know just I mean, incredible for me really to see you know how it all works and fits together got back did another couple of courses and then Hurricane Irma happened and I went out twice to the Caribbean um, on Hurricane Irma. So I got four deployments in 2017 and pretty much all my courses. So, you know, at that stage, I was living off my military pension and just doing, you know, React stuff. So, and then I sort of, you know, was fairly experienced because it was four deployments and all the courses under my belt. So that was it, really. <laughs> well, so what, what's been your most challenging deployment today? Um, probably the Sri Lankan one, to be honest, because I'd only just really joined the organization um really difficult when you know there's you've got a bunch of people who you don't know beforehand and you're suddenly uh, uh, training has changed significantly since then so you'll always know you, you'll, you'll have a lot more visibility of who you're deploying with but i went outside uh you know flew from uh to sri lanka and didn't know the people and suddenly I didn't even know I was going to be in charge and they sort of put me in charge oh by the way can you be in charge and you're in charge of finances oh and also the um uh the, the photographer and <laughs> I was like what <laughs> um and, and then you sort of trying to get fixes that you know to help you get transport and and there was a few personality issues so to me that was the hardest one because I was sort of juggling loads of balls I was new to this uh, I still really enjoyed it and I think we did some really good stuff but that that to me was the hardest one yeah um what was the situation what was the situ situation how widespread was the, the devastation out there? it was quite localized but it was terrible i mean the, the flooding was absolutely huge i mean you're talking <coughs> about sort of three meters uh the house is completely um submerged in water um and all the drinking wells had been um polluted and it, so we ended up rebuilding a bridge um, over a river so the kids could walk to school taking 10 minutes, not an hour and a half. We put a roof on someone's house, some vulnerable person's house, which had completely blown off. Uh, and the third task was three, and the, the wells, and just working out which wells were um, 
had potable water and and ones which you know shouldn't be drunk from. So it, it it was it was really good. It was very different to what we were doing now, but it was good for my learning. And it was you know we did some good out there. And I hope the bridge is still standing. And I hope you know the I think that you know we went the, the, the people who were there got a lot out of it. But the locals, I think you know got a lot of a lot out of us. We were helping you know we we're getting people to help us the whole time using the locals where we could. Mm. Yeah. How does um. When you, I don't know if you've given it any thought, but mm. how does your experience with when you've been with React mm. and on deployments, uh, how do you find that compares to your experiences when you were deploying, when you were still serving? Mm. Do you see s- similarities? I guess the team bonding, yes, absolutely. And you're relying on your, you, you've just got to rely on people. Um, but the responsibility is probably more so when you're with React, a smaller team. And so on the recce team, it'll just be me and Paul Taylor. <coughs> and, you know, we make decisions and we'll just phone back and make sure we, you know, we've got the authorization. But it, it's um, y- the, the teams are the same thing. You're working hard together for each other. And that's that's the sort of similarities. But but to be honest, you are given a lot more responsibility when you're, you know, you don't know what you're going to get to when you go out and you go out. So my so one of the deployments, I had a phone call 7 p.m. Christmas Eve. Uh, Lizzie, can you can you go tomorrow um, to um, uh, Indonesia? I was like, what Christmas Day tomorrow? And then, yeah, yeah, Christmas Day tomorrow. Um, so you know, you pack your bags. You've got you you're, you're fully immunized. And they said, oh, by the way, it's not just going to uh, Indonesia tomorrow. Y- you've got to go via America to go and pick up the water purification kit. So I flew London, Amsterdam. Detroit, Boston, Doha, Jakarta. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Who gave you that phone call? Oh, uh, it was Sam. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. I looked at the flight and I went, are you taking the mickey? I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm going out to... And they went, yeah, you've got to meet this dude called, I don't know, Barry or something. And with this great big youth with a Christmas tree on the front on Christmas Day. So he took me to McDonald's. I went, really? <laughs> <laughs> And at every flight, I had dramas, whether uh, getting on there or missing flights. I mean, it was every airport was a huge drama. But I got to Indonesia exhausted. I didn't know what day of the week it was. The team greeted me, didn't know most of them, but got on with my house on fire and had a 12-hour drive. <laughs> Flipping out. Yeah. What's that? Uh, what about contrast, if there is any contrast, between um, responding in, in, to a disaster and someone like the BVIs? Mm. Or respond to disaster in a developing country? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, when someone's had a disaster, it's been the worst day of their life. And similarities of that, you know, whether you're in the BVIs and you've got money or you haven't, or you're in Indonesia and you've got nothing, y- you know, you have experienced something which no one should ever experience. I guess the contrast is... is you know, just the money, I guess. And but, but it, if you're going to somewhere that's devastated, they don't have cars, they don't have fuel, they don't have. So, so it, it is always quite similar because you're always, you know, one thing we don't deploy with is vehicles, and we one thing we need to get around are vehicles. And we'll walk if we have to, but it makes your life a lot easier if you can find vehicles. So, wherever the disaster is you know, this common thread of, the, you know, wide-eyed people and they see disaster response on you and, you know, you they, they see hope, they see someone's coming out to reach them, to help them and it doesn't really matter who they are. They, you know, they're just wanting help and, you know, that, that look of... I, 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 Paul, when Paul and I deploy, he knows I'm a hugger and I'll just go and hug people and people will cry and they're just relieved that someone's there to help them and to listen to their story. And it doesn't really matter where you are in the world, that's the same. And, you know, you do get really emotionally involved as well. It's when someone's sort of sobbing in your arms and, you know, their family have nearly died and the, the, everything they have is ruined. It doesn't matter if you're in the in Bahamas or in Indonesia. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just wherever you go is really similar, that, that human experience. Yeah, it's very different, isn't it, mm. to where we're serving. I, mm. I, uh, one of the things that surprised me, um, when I deployed overseas with with you guys, um, and I, I got emotional mm. a, a couple of times, and mm. it would happen at the same time. There was a repeated thing that would happen when we went into, we went into villages, and they realised that we were bringing them help, 
uh, food. Mm. Um, and I always, when the translator would, or the interpreter, or the local, I think mm. interpreter, the local who could speak English, would translate it to the, the village elder and all the villagers there, and they'll all be, they'll, they'll be frantic because they needed help. And the, as soon as that piece of information is conveyed, look, we're coming back, we're going to leave now, but we're coming back. Because, mm. like you say, we found vehicles and trailers, mm. and we just pile them up with, mm. with food and that. Mm-hmm. We're coming back with food, and you're going to get food and you're gonna, from us, and you're going to get shelter. And, and they'd all, and the whole, everyone would start cheering at the same time. And uh, I, it would just make me well up every time, every time I think flipping out. And it, it was because they'd gone from extreme sadness and uh, panic and this state of extreme unhappiness to extreme happiness. They were getting help. Mm. And, uh, we, 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 you, you know, you'd say that, but you become emotionally involved. Mm. That is one thing that you, mm. I never experienced that when I was serving. I didn't. No. And, it's, and, you know, mm. we definitely went and helped people and it was, there were times where people were in need and you had that... You know that impact on 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 mostly we never communicate with people on on that sort of whole township together level or whole mm. village together level. Just the way that not the, the military they didn't really see it like that. But when you see that collective happiness yeah. on, in the face of extreme adversity, man, it's, a, it's a, a completely different experience. And you're experiencing, you know, you're there and they see you living pretty rough because the volunteers, you know, we we don't live in salubrious. Um, uh, surroundings. You know, we put a mosquito pod up, and you know we'll purify our own water to drink, and we'll, we'll eat maybe once a day sort of ration packs or something. And um, you know it's not we're we're not sort of living it up, and and they'll they'll see us, and they'll see us experiencing you know hardship, no lose, no showers, you know, and it's they'll understand because what we don't do is go and stay fifteen miles out, you know, a hotel that survived. We'll go and stay right in the nub of where the problems are, and just put our mosquito pods up there. And if it's raining, you know, just put a tarpaulin over it, and you know, and just so very much we'll stay exactly where we need to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, are you going to find? Do you think you'll find it difficult after this year and a half of <laughs> frantic react response, op react? stuff going back to normal daily routine yeah what is normal now eh? right, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's the new normal um no i don't think so i think i mean th- there's still a lot of react stuff going on i'm a trustee and you know there's there's always um stuff to do with react there's always emails coming in and you know obviously i'm always you know i, I don't see my relationship with react changing um but you know life goes back whatever that's going to look like um i'm still an army reservist i still put uniform on now and again i still do a lot of sport uh, which is where my heart is you know and so life will just carry on hopefully i'll get a bit of work coming in um which i think i, I will that sort of was put on pause really since march last year but you know that'll come back i'm pretty sure <laughs> yeah yeah. Do you prefer the entrepreneurial side of stuff or do you prefer the, the, the uh, volunteer side of stuff? Because the entrepreneurialism it, is quite... No, I don't think it's entrepreneurial. I, well, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I think it... Well, it sh- you started a business, didn't you? It is, but okay. I just consult. So I, I don't, it's not sort of... Sorry. I, yeah, yeah, it's not earning mega bucks. <laughs> um, yeah, see, uh, <laughs> it's that word entrepreneurialism, yeah. isn't it? See, I, 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 <clears throat> it depends on people's interpretation of it. Interpretation, interpretation. Interpretation, interpretation. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> interpretation of it. Some people get, uh, yeah, it, it, they they try and stay away from it. I don't know. I see it as anyone starting a business. That's yeah, I but it, it's 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 really. I mean, it it's it's very very small. So I, I mean, I, you know, it's nice to earn a little bit of money on top of my pension and, and a bit of my military stuff coming in. Um, you know, I really like the portfolio job. So someone <laughs> says, "Do you fancy doing this?" I look at my diary. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll do that. You know, why not? just keep it fresh keep it interesting and you know i don't know really what my weeks look like uh, so i went oh i'm getting okay, out to see you today you know <laughs> <laughs> um you know so i've got always always busy always got stuff going on how much time are you committing to the reserves at the moment do you do much time with them? um that's a good question so last the f- wave one of covid i did all react wave two i was still react but working from home and i did some military stuff as well for sjc so it's it's quite handy because the stuff i watch i can then sort of pass on um i have done a bit of adventure training for them already this year and hopefully more to come 
Um, you, got so, you got that grin in your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love the most. It's, what are you uh, doing? Uh, I was doing some scrambling in Sky. I've been doing some sailing in Solent. Mo I've what? Scrambled motorbike scrambling? No, climbing oh, right. scrambling. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> No, real scrambling was, you know, gripping the rock. Um, what's, what, hang on, what's the difference between scrambling and rock climbing? A, well, rock climbing. A bit of bouldering. I've yeah, it, it's, it's almost, uh, so scrambling, you get different grades. Um, and it, it's not just walking over a, a cliff, but it's sort of a bit roped up. So it's a bit between rock climbing and um, moving over. The, but it's just incredible. I, I mean, I'm no good at heights and we were up some really funky stuff carrying quite a lot of weight because we had our overnight kit. And, um, You're no good at heights, you say? No, I'm no good at heights. What do you mean? Def define no good, Lizzie. Um, I find it hard to imagine you be no good at anything like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm put me on a height and my knees are knocking. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was it was very cool. We were on some very, very sharp uh, ridges with sort of sheer drop either side and I managed it. Where was this? Uh, Isle of Sky. Sky. Isle yeah, Sky. yeah, Isle of Sky. So near the Coolins. And it's, um, have you seen the Danny McCaskill clip where he rides his bike down this slab if you haven't seen it go to watch it is it um is is it a bit greenery on it as well no a uh, mm, little bit but it's if you just type in danny mccaskill the slab and yeah, he cycles down he's absolutely nuts and the making of it is more interesting that we s s scrambled up that oh. and then i'd abseil off a sort of 50 meter peak to then climb up another bit it was brilliant actually but yeah i've never been to this guy i was up I was up to Scotland a couple of weekends back, yeah. doing the north coast. Okay. Hang on, Sky. Yeah, Sky's northwest. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> I was getting confused then. I had um, what's that one? What's that one uh, down between Guernsey and Jersey, the tiny island? Oh yeah, it's not that. What's that one called? Uh, uh, that's not Sky, is it? No, no, no. It's got some weird name because of that. And I was getting confused. Yeah, it's definitely not that one. It yeah. was definitely Scotland. Yeah. We I, I, I could see Sky. I could see Sky from the coast. Yeah, yeah it's definitely. beautiful. That was amazing. That yeah, we was did. Amazing. Bit of, we, we carried our kit with us and bivvied out on one of the beaches overnight. It was just brilliant. Midges? Did you get any Actually, midges? amazingly not. I couldn't w believe it. When was this? When did you go? Um, I think May, end of May. Oh. No, no midges. We went beginning of June. Okay. So, and it was, we did four, four nights. We had four nights going from the, uh, going anti-clockwise from, we actually started at Glasgow. Anyway, long story short, <laughs> the first three nights, zero midges. Mm -hmm. Zero midges. The last night, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. When they come, they come, don't oh they? Oh my God. I'd forgotten how bad they get. It was unreal. Uh, it was unreal. I was in Wales last weekend, mountain biking, uh, Afan, and the midges were out. Pretty miserable. <laughs> I don't miss them. No. I don't miss them at all. Do you miss anything about being um, permanent, permanent uh, uh, regular? No. No, because um, absolutely not. I mean, I loved my career. I did 20 years, really enjoyed it. And, you know, I'm very proud of what I did and love my life now. So not at all. Really glad I did what I did and really glad I got out when I did. You ended up as company commander at Sanders for That's three right. years. Uh, no, two and a half years. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So 20, uh, September 2012 until sort of May 2015. Did you... Well, how long is it normally done? Is it's normally two, two years, year but I, um, because I had signed off, um, they asked me to extend because I was in the middle of a commissioning course. They said, look, can you just, I had all male companies said, can you just see the end of the boys and make sure they commission? So I saw it to the end of their commissioning. And then when they commissioned in December, I then left Sanders, but I hadn't had any resettlement. So then I sort of negotiated a decent package to get some more resettlement and after Sanders. Because when you're there as an instructor, you don't have any time. No, I remember, yeah, mates who went down there, it was just yeah. hectic. I loved it though, really enjoyed it. Um, but it's, it is a bit like being an op tour, you just don't have any time to yourself. It's a weird old place in it, Sanders, yeah. it's a weird old place. It is. When you were there, were they still doing beagling as one of the optional sports? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> don't think they did. The <laughs> so I went down. They <laughs> beagling is <were trying laughs> a sport. <laughs> they were trying to, uh, I'd been earmarked to go to Sanders as an instructor. And they, I went down, they sent a bunch of us down. For, yeah, and they were having a problem at the time as well, getting power edge guys to want to go to Sanders. And instruct, no one wanted to go. We wanted to go to Brecon and instruct the Brecon. Of course you do. Yeah, basically. And I was one of those people. And um, they went down to look at life for a week. And I, that's one of the things that stuck in my mind is, um, <laughs> uh, it was, it was uh, yeah, a list of, there was a list of every, I, I'm trying to remember, you know better than me, but 
the the officer cadets or not officer cadets, the young officers. Had yeah, to, no, the officer cadets. Officer cadets. They yeah. had to choose a sport or at least one yeah, sport. Two sports, yeah, yeah. And uh, two sports, and, and on the list was beagling. <laughs> Fucking beagling. <laughs> <laughs> like beagling that way. <laughs> Unbelievable. I know. Yeah. And the other thing that stuck in my mind about that was about Sandhurst was, um, and I also experienced this actually when I was when we were. We were doing the exercising troops for the uh, f- uh, field commander's course for, okay. know, for um, captain to major. Yeah. Or majors going into field command roles, okay. right? Okay. Uh, was um, foreign foreign students, foreign officer cadets. Overseas cadets. Overseas cadets who were at Sanders trying to... Uh, Poor, some Jesus. of them. Jesus. They, you, I mean, my my junior terms were always the February, uh, the January one. And these poor dudes that arrived from the Middle East looking frozen. <laughs> January in England. A completely different Just world. Miserable. Completely different world. And we, we had one j- dropped into my platoon. Um, I say we, we had one, didn't we? Had a, we, had a, we, had a, we had a section of we had a section of officer cadets. That's right. It was the, it was the it was the field commander's course. I can't remember what the course was called, but for majors going to field command positions, right? And as p- their their companies were mm. made up of regular tr- troops, so in this case, part of reg, mm-hmm. and officer cadets. So we had some officer officer cadets. I'm trying to if I remember this right. And it was a, we had a Jordanian soldier, <laughs> and uh, we were getting ready for a, a company attack, and everyone's forming up, helmets on. Get your helmets on. This Jordanian soldier wouldn't put put his helmet on, and I said, uh, and we had those permanent staff as well. Right? And I said, Can you get your helmet on. I said no. I said, mate, you get your helmet on, please. I didn't say, mate, get your helmet on. And he said, I said, why not? And it'd be raining, right? <laughs> this is a Mark Six, mind. It'd be raining. And he said, because he, he wouldn't put his helmet on because he, apparently it had shrunk in the rain. <laughs> it <had> shrunk. <laughs> Can't bluff or bluff but, um, but the, the permanent staff said, just, like, leave it, leave him. Don't just leave it be. You know, there's no point in because I wasn't like permanent staff. I was I was in the battalion, so I delivered a, sh- a shorter fuse than what the permanent <laughs> staff had to so just to walk away. But you know, maybe, yeah, mad, mad. I would want to be those guys. Some of them would be good, but you know. Yeah, I no, mean, some of them were brilliant. Some of them were absolutely brilliant, but they weren't all brilliant. <laughs> on that subject, yeah, which are the most uh, interesting and amusing uh, nationalities that you work with at Sanders? Ooh. <laughs> Oh, it's it's put me dirt. on the spot here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I had to say some of that. Um, crikey, I, I to me, I wear one guy from Africa, and and I can't remember where in Africa. I think it, I don't think it was Kenya. Might have been Kenya, and the poor bloke, he was always cold. It was even a hot day, and he'd be cold. But he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. What he did, just cold the, the entire time. And, you know, just you know, final exercise was in that final exercise was in Dumfries and Galloway. And it was the biggest rain they'd ever had up there. And this guy was just absolutely in clip. <laughs> um, but but brilliant. And you could just see one thing, not one thing to be pulled off. And you know, just one thing to, to remain there. But I mean, he was getting hypothermic. Um, some really good guys from Afghanistan. I had two oh, really? brilliant. Um, one got the overseas award actually. Um, Hashmatullah. Um, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, some people struggle with a bit of English. Um, not all great. Um, but it's yeah. We had one brilliant American guy. I mean, it's hardly overseas really. If it's coming from America, but it's you know it still is and it still counted. Well, it's very we're a very different army to yeah. them. Our vocal force yeah. to them, aren't we? Yeah, that's interesting. So when he, when he came over, was he already in a, in the U.S. Yeah. military? Yeah. So he came over just as a yeah. He'd been he he'd done some quite funky stuff actually. And he in the first term he dislocated his knee. He was in the first exercise in Barossa, and I'm going up, and his knee was. Point it was completely off, and I was like, "That's it, game over." His military career probably over, and he shoved it back. Oh my god! And I know, absolutely nails. And um, uh, six weeks later, I mean, he, he he said, "No, no, keep me on everything. Just don't do sport." And and he didn't even need to get back termed. It was or, or um, why listed? It was amazing. He just carried on, and you know, strength of this dude. <laughs> what, unit, what unit was he? Do you remember? Uh, no, I can't remember. 
just dragging some memories. There was, the it. thing is, I had your three <laughs> different companies, you know. <laughs> Crikey, that seems like a long time ago now as well. Did you work a lot when? Where did you deploy to? Where, where were your deployments when you were serving? Uh, so I went straight out to Bosnia, um, 96. Uh, so I was in Sarajevo, and that was quite funky. Um, that was it, was it was quite volatile. I remember sort of we, I got shot at in a tunnel. Um, there's a couple of vehicles, and there were sort of small arms, and we were like, crikey, and got out, and the Land Rover was in had some bullet holes in it it was all a bit close for comfort that and you know you no body armor in those days or anything like that um and what was the task what was the task you so there? i was arc support battalion so headquarters arc and we were just looking after them uh the, the staff officers in the headquarters arc um and you know as a young second lieutenant <laughs> i hadn't got a clue what was going on but it's good deployment for me but it was a long deployment it was 11 months for Jesus. Yeah, so I only did about seven or eight months of that, but it was a, a long old one. Um, you know, very, very different to what deployments are like now. And um, and then just uh, Iraq a couple of times, one 2003 during the war, so doing Telic 1. And uh, yeah, that was, I was ops officer, at six supply, uh, Royal Logistic Corps. And that was really interesting for me because, you know, you get out, I got there out there in the January and it big ass bit of desert right put the headquarters up here uh, what here yeah and so you know very little kit coming across and and then suddenly everything was coming you sort of building up so it was really interesting sort of going from from absolutely nothing to you know and then during the war itself when it all kicked off i think it was about the 20th of march i think it's that, that everything started um you know you could feel the um the missiles taking off around you because we were in the the same base as the american logistic marines so massive base and we had all our ammunition it was huge huge base and you're talking miles here and i used to go up every day to the the american compound to sort of liaise with them and uh yeah so that was uh, that was quite quite spicy at times you know we've got stuff i mean if, if a missile had hit us been pretty lucky because it's such a big ass base in the desert um but that was so you've been taught those when you're on the base, Q8 you're on about, right? Yeah, in Q8. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and yeah. So were, they, were you being targeted then? A little bit, yeah. I mean, because we, we were the third line logistics, so if they got us, then I guess that um, it would have been a, a good good hit for them, but they never got lucky, thankfully. Uh, I didn't realise, because I was out there too, I were didn't realise there was that kind of targeting going on. I mean, I was yeah. just a Tom at the time, and you, yeah. you, you we were in, I was with three power, okay. so I've got no idea where we were. We were in <laughs> flipping desert somewhere, and these massive bloody tents, um, but it wasn't a big camp. Well, well, our little camp wasn't big, but uh, you know, it was. It would have been part of a bigger sort of um, uh, what you call it. You know, little camps dotted around it, all over each other, mutually supporting. But so you know, I didn't realize that target was going on. I mean, all that, all that we knew of the uh, of um, potential attacks that were going on was when lightning got shouted. Yeah, lightning, lightning, lightning. Yeah, eh? lightning, lightning. Get your lightning, gas yeah. mask on. We we were given a pigeon. Um, we didn't know enough. Um, um, cams and naiads, you know, to detect what was going on. So we were literally given, I'm not taking a mickey, we got given two pigeons. We no put way. I promise, I swear to goodness, I'm not lying. So just explain what camera, uh, um, uh, naiads and... So what ner other? nerve agent detecting kit and when you cam. How did you remember those Can names? I'd forgotten <laughs> all about those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chemical agent monitoring. That's right, so yeah. Is it, yeah that, is and it? they didn't have the right battery them. So, I mean, it was just hilarious. You get out there and it's like, what? Well, okay, so we haven't got anything to detect what's going on. So this, and the Americans said, well, here's two pigeons. <laughs> really? I mean, this is 2003. You can't, you can't write this stuff down right. So we had one pigeon in our headquarters that obviously got a regimental number and uh, <laughs> you know and then we put one down by the ammo site but the americans on their humvees were driving around with chickens in cages on the front of the humvees and i promise i'm not lying <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and oh then when we had the, the call so rather than gas 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 it was american one which is lightning 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 you had to chuck your mbc <laughs> gear on and um sit under a six foot picket table wooden table <laughs> hopefully you know i mean not offering you a lot of protection is it had the radio and uh and then the first time we thought we we're getting gas we're like uh okay who's going to take their respirator first and i'm not <laughs> and you know you're meant to do the sniff test really might be stuff out there you don't know Are the pigeons still alive brilliant 
<laughs> the, problem, the problem we had, being flipping morons, is that it came a point in time, it was just constantly getting called, you take your mask off, oh. constantly getting called. People started calling it for a laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> honest to God. So, someone would shout, gas, gas, gas. So, we were, I'm sure you're shouting lightning, lightning, lightning. Uh, someone, someone would shout, lightning, lightning, lightning somewhere, sitting away, giggling, probably in a port loo, <laughs> probably in a port loo, <laughs> giggling. And that would send the whole camp into, into meltdown. Everyone's then masked up. And what happens when that, when no one's called it, no one stands it down. No one gives the all clear. Cause it's not being called. So and everyone's it's boiling waiting, hot. And you're everyone's waiting for an all Romeo. clear. Exactly. Everyone's waiting for an all clear. You're wearing a respirator, you're full kit. It, the all clear's not coming because no one called it officially. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> unbelievable. So then what happens? People don't bother masking up. You know, you didn't bother because you never knew it was a fucking joke or not. Honest to God. <laughs> it's like, what on earth? What uh, on earth? That was funny. We, I mean, we didn't have a very, uh, um, what do you call it, eventful in inverted commas, war. Thankfully. You know, I say, but yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it was flipping an experience for everyone. I yeah. Think. I mean, well, you and I'll never get to do that again. <laughs> you know, an, an invasion. But, uh, yeah. I know. No, I know. It does seem like a long time Look. ago, though, right? Because I was on Safe Surreal 2, which is 2001, in Amman, and went back to Germany 2002, and then 2003, Telic 1. 18 years ago, Lizzie. Oh God, I mean, eighteen feel old. years. No, ago. Say, say, I'm not that old. <laughs> mental. I am that old. Damn it. Absolutely mental. I know. Yeah. And, uh, Nuts. Did you go back out to Iraq after that? Just once. You did, yeah. yeah. When, when did you go? Um, 2005. Same with me. Was it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you got, where were you? Uh, just based um with the um, 102 log brigade headquarters. So. Shaiba. Yeah. Was there, a yeah. Weird place. Weird That's place. we were, yeah. Weird place. Buses going around, yeah. taking you. Jingly buses. <laughs> that was a different world. That was. Yeah. So anyway, glad, glad all that's not, you're not on my agenda anymore. To be honest. No, they were crap tours, weren't they? I mean, depending on what you're doing, depending on what you're doing. Again, I, I was very naive. I think I have been very naive a lot when I was still serving, and then when I left. If actually, up until about the point of the podcast, <laughs> where. Um, I started realizing it's 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 ignorance. It's uh, you like unit ignorance. And I started realizing that uh, okay, there were like people had some pretty tasty times mm. in different places where you thought it was completely benign. Iraq was dodgy, mm. but it certainly wasn't very dodgy to me when I was there. No. Or at least it didn't appear so. But then there's other people at the same time. That's some really absolutely bad. Absolutely yeah. smashed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. I know a lot of people suffering. Post Iraq, post Afghan, lots of people suffering, aren't there? Yeah, <laughs> good, 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 uh, interesting top actually. Uh, you know, you you mentioned Paul a couple of times, and mm. um, I, I remember, I, I remember, we were t- in fact, it wasn't long after I got introduced to React, and the vet, the ex military, the veteran suicide rate was very much front and center of attention of mm. the military community mm. two years ago. Two years ago, it still is now, not as much as it was then, I don't think. And uh, you know, um, I knew, or I know that there's been a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people I know of within the units I serve, or the unit I serve in, uh, three para, um, and other people I've met through just different things, ex-military, who have, who have either not here anymore <laughs> mm. because they decided that they didn't want to be here anymore, mm. or are suffering really badly. Um, but I wasn't sure. It's hard to tell how widespread something is in like that. And I asked Paul when mm. we were down, what were they doing? I can't what course I was doing down at React or oh, Team Rubicon U- UK at the time. And I asked him, I said, because Paul's Fusiliers, wasn't he? Absolutely. I said, mate, what's, 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 your, what's it like with Fusiliers with um, people not in a good place and people killing themselves? And, and I explained why I was asking. And he said, is that the same? Like, absolute nightmare. Mm. Lo- loads of people. Mm. Like, just crazy. Mm. And uh, too many, we in? but it, things are improving. I think, I think improve, things have improved rapidly over the last eighteen months, two years because of because it's been talked about. Yeah, because there's more awareness of mental ill health. I mm-hmm. think Cause it's always been around. Yeah, it's definitely more talk spoken about now. It's, it's you know I know that the, the hierarchy very much see it and understand it better 
wouldn't say they've got it completely nailed, but it's it's definitely more of an understanding now and an acceptance that it's there. How did you find it when you were in? What was your experience with other people or with yourself? Anything like that? Any of the units you serve with? Um, funny enough, the first time I'd seen PTSD was when I was teaching on JOTAC, so Junior Officers Tactical Awareness course in Warminster. And oh, when was that? That must have been, crikey, um, something like 2000 and... Crikey, I can't even remember what year it was now. But I was um, a teaching the Royal Marine, a young Royal Marine um, lieutenant. And he came up to me halfway through and said, I can't cope with this. And I'd not seen PTSD before. And he said, look, I think I'm struggling. And I literally, it's the first time I saw it, I remember. And I was like, crikey, okay. And he had a really, really nasty tour. And, you know, it was, it was hard to find where to signpost him and what to do, but we managed it. And that was, that, I remember that was the first time. So I think that was about 2006. Oh, early on then? Yeah. Yeah, it was early on, which is why it was, um, it was quite surprising. You know, it, it's... You know, I'd, I'd just not seen it, and he, you know, he'd, he'd had a really bad time. And I remember saying to the SO1, the, the colonel there, got this guy that I'm not overly happy with. You know, he's something's not right with him. And you know, usually bootnecks are you know, sort of happy-go-lucky and really, um, and this guy wasn't. And yeah, it was the first time I'd seen it. It's not a fair play to him coming out for yeah. with it then, yeah. back yeah. then, because yeah. it definitely isn't a situation it is now. Yeah, no, it's really yeah. new to say. I remember um, when I, uh, it was it was after our, I think the third time we went out, to, uh, three power went out to Afghan, and I remember there was a, um, I don't want to say the rank, but there was a, a person of rank, and they ended up having a really bad time, hmm. PTSD, um, and at the end it up, eventually, after, after a, maybe s- I don't know. I don't know how long it was. I don't want to speculate. But coming back and going back into a frontline position, you know, a command position, um, which is amazing. Mm. And this must have been two. It was just after. I'm not going to say what it was just after because again, I'll do that. There's not many people who mm. had this experience, right? Um, so I don't want to ping, ping the guy. But um, it was at a time when it was just really surprising two or three, four years before, I wouldn't have imagined that would happen. It would have been like a career stopper mm-hmm. where, you'd, where you'd end up always being in a G4 chain. Mm-hmm. No offence. You know, no, going from yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, not front line. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, going into G4, something that wasn't, it was in an infantry battalion, it certainly wasn't considered to be, uh, it's considered to be a bit easier because it is in those in those units. Yeah. You know, it's just like you're not, you know, you're not up in, th- there's less pressure. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. which is good. I think uh, things are improving. I think so. I hope but so. I know there's people still suffering. The problem is how do you measure it? The problem is how do you measure it? It's the same like veteran homelessness. Yeah. How do you measure it? I don't know. <sighs> but I'm hoping things like React are helping because I know um, that a few veterans who signed up with us had nothing and that they, that, that React gave them a purpose during covid which is the most incredible thing. So it does, you know, React is incredible because, yes, we help people and we do the most amazing stuff. And whether it's working in a mortuary or turning COVID patients in a hospital or it's delivering food with fair share or whatever it is, but it repurposes those people. And I know a few veterans that were struggling during the pandemic who signed up, who then were part of a team again. And so it really is the most incredible thing that you put someone and they feel a sense of purpose. You're back into familiar surroundings, aren't you? Yeah. It could be behind, it could be hard to find a route back into it when you when you're away from it because a lot a lot of the time people are. I mean, for me, it's quite easy for me to be stay involved with in the military community. Mm. One through the podcast, two because I'm geographically close to some ex-military folk. Mm. I work with ex-military folks. Mm. I'm very lucky. Mm. Other people don't have that. Mm. They don't have it. And it's hard to find a route back in to it and and yeah. benefit from the yeah. positive bits of the military yeah. as opposed to the negative yeah. like which is it's interesting with react it's, it's yeah. exactly what you said it is um it's a, a way back into that community on your own on your own terms yeah more importantly on yeah. your own terms you know not pressure to do anything no take as much or as little as you want absolutely um and I know that Resilient who have employed a few people um I think there was when they were doing some work in Babcock they were 
paying people because that's part of it was you know you're you paying the individuals and they dug a few people out of holes you know giving people job for a couple of weeks you know and just incredible and i know that um, that really helped a number of people out who were really struggling. So it is completely repurposing the, the military veteran. And, you know, React Now, it's not about the military veteran. It's now about the right person. It doesn't matter if you're military or not military. During the pandemic, it was we were taking anyone ex-military or not risk, but we're taking anyone now. And if the right person comes along, whether they're, you know, whoever they are, as long as you, you it's the military approach that we use, but we're not military. You know, we don't try and be military. We just you know use the military approach oh i didn't realize i didn't realize that it changed yeah well it's uh, yeah because i knew it changed during the pandemic yeah i didn't we'll, realize it was staying yeah we'll we'll so we'll 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 remain using the, the military approach but absolutely we'll take on anyone who fits because you know not everyone it's not a fit for everyone for sure um but it, it's you know and it's there is no rank structure within react you know you go out and you're all the same but you will have a strike team leader um you know and it's tough when you're saying to someone, would you mind doing that? And they're like, well, you've got a rank. Well, no, I don't, but please do it. You know, this is the way React work. And so we need to make sure people are able to do that, um, you know, fulfill the role they're doing. And, um, you know, so some people aren't made for it. And you get some incredible people who have never done anything military in their life. Um, and they are absolutely perfect fit for the organization. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I've mentioned it before. It was talking to Paul, you know, uh, there was a, Couple of civilians when I on on the team when I was when I went out to Mozambique and they were fantastic. Yeah, you know, co and completely unexpectedly. Yeah. I did not expect. You know, no, just not what I expected. I, know. I shamelessly say. Yeah, I, you know, I, shamelessly say I know you think that. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. you know, they won't have the same, but absolutely they do. You know, hundred percent. Yeah, and it's just the right sort of person. It doesn't doesn't have to be military or ex blue light or whatever. Just the right sort of person. What's um what we not talked about? You want to talk about? Is there anything we haven't mentioned about React? Or, yeah, what's uh, the next the next six months are going to be interesting, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be about training. It's going to be about training, uh, uh, you know, capturing who we have signed up with us and making sure we're getting the training done. And the head of um, IT, he, you know, he's moving everything um, more digitally and it's, it's looking a lot more professional. Um, you know, we're just trying to get everything... Um, where it needs to be and uh, you're making sure that where React and Resilience sit with each other, with the development committee, making sure we get the right CEO um, and making sure we get the right staff, making sure the fundraising comes on again as well because obviously we need funds to, to pay for the charity, although the, you know, the volunteers are free. The, absolutely, the accommodation's not you know, chill mark at the moment, wherever it's going to be next, so finding a new home, really important. So there's a lot of working parts really before Christmas and then that's even before you even think about deployment. So you know, hurricane season comes and we make sure we've got enough trained responders, uh, international responders for that. Mm -hmm. So you know, all the training that needs to go on and make sure everyone's immunised and got the right DVS and there's a lot of, a lot of work to do. Yeah, interesting. Mm. I'm excited to see how, how things develop. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Yeah. MB, <laughs> what's that experience like? How did you find out? How did you get told you got awarded an MB? Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you. Um, I actually found out by email. It was, um, I was washing up. My boyfriend was by my computer. He said, oh, you got an email coming. Oh, um, you might want to look at this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and it sort of swears you to secrecy and said, don't tell anyone for a couple of weeks until it's gazetted. Oh, crikey, was not expecting that at all. Completely blew me out of the water. You know, it's, there's so many people who are deserving, like literally hundreds in the charity that, that were deserving. And mm. feels very, um, it felt very weird that I had been selected. Um, you know, I was chuffed a bit, don't get me wrong, but it was so many people were deserving. And um, yeah, so like, it was all, I think, formalised. It came out in the Gazette on the 9th or 10th of October, and uh, that weekend, my phone went fairly crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and let's say I drank quite a lot of champagne. <laughs> um, Was there a ceremony? Not yet. So There's going to be one. Yeah, so um, it, it, there is, but obviously because it's COVID and, I mean, there's a huge backlog now because uh, the New Year's Honours this 2020, 
you know, was announced around New Year and then COVID kicked in in March. So it's going to be hangovers from that, from, you know, there's four, um, four of the Queen's honours list, which they've got a backload of people. So they actually wanted me to go today. Um, and I said, no, I'm already But busy. you chose the HR I podcast chose, instead. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I hadn't got a dress. <laughs> Um, yeah. What did you go where? In say where, where? Where's it done? It, well, it's either St James's or Buckingham Palace, and I've yeah. been invited St James's. So, and then they gave me a couple of other dates, and I got some work on. And I, I was like, I've got to take on work when I get it now. Oh, so they give you date options. Yeah. I didn't realise this. Come on, give yeah. some. <laughs> right, so, de- so you have to align your date with the Queen. Well, right, you guys, yeah, I, I, you I guys doubt it'll be text. the Queen. Yeah. You guys text. <laughs> yeah. Liz <laughs> and I were having a bit of a WhatsApp chat. <laughs> um, no, so they sent me one date, and I wrote back and said, I'm really. So I can't make that. And then they gave me a couple of others and I went, I still can't make that. And so they said, listen, when we got some more, we'll, we'll fire you with, with some more dates. And then you get a scroll, which is really cool. I got a scroll through the post the other day and it's signed by Prince Philip. Nah. Yeah, I swear. No way. It is. Yeah. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So one of the last things he probably did. Oh my God. I know. That's incredible, isn't it? How big is the scroll? A3. That's massive. It's massive. It's framed already. <laughs> where, where, where are you going to hang it? Um, don't say in the toilet. No, it won't be in the loo. Um, I, I've got it at the moment in the sitting room. I don't know whether it's going to stay there, but I, I framed it before I got mi- messy fingers all over it. <laughs> I'd make loads of copies of it every, every wall in the room <laughs> and on the outside walls of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. That's quite has, cool. uh, what, have, has anything changed since you got awarded it? Are people, are people hounding you? No, I'm not really hounded. No. <laughs> I drank a lot of champagne, but that that always that's always there anyway. So uh, no, nothing's changed. Um, you know, a lot. My family are very proud, and um, I thought it should be. Yeah. So no, it's it's you know it's it's a wonderful um, thing. But say it's so many deserving people, and it feels very strange to have been singled out. Um, but you know, hugely appreciated. Well, you're very modest, Lizzie. Very modest and thoroughly, obviously, thoroughly deserving of it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and congratulations. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah, you too. React. What's the website now? React response. React response. React disaster response. React disaster response. Dot. Oh no! Oh. Are we both going to get shot by someone? I think we might get shot because they've changed the. They website, have. It's they? react re dash act. Oh, that's right. But I think it depends whether wh- which social media you're on. I'm on about the website. The website. I think it's re dash act. dot org. dot uk. That sounds right. Uh, oh yeah, re dash act. Well done. You went. I failed. Phew. <laughs> 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 I'm not kicked off. <laughs> re r e re dash act. dot org. dot uk. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, in fact, see, React is a response. It's yeah, easy to find. you Google There's that. And it's React on reality. Twitter, it's on Insta, it's on Facebook, it's on LinkedIn, and I don't know any of the other social medias. TikTok, no idea. <laughs> oh, that'd be amusing if React was on TikTok, <laughs> wouldn't it? Who would be doing those videos? <laughs> Goodness me. I think Paul Taylor should do one. <laughs> yeah, Paul. Because Spider on, uh, yeah. spider on uh, TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> He'd probably be up for that as well. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Um, good luck thank with you. React. Obviously, and everything's yeah. going to because crazy times at the moment. Just lots of change going on. Yeah. Very difficult, very challenging. Yeah. And um, and good luck. Thank you very with much you, indeed. With thank life you. And with the business. Thank it's been you. A pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. Thank you. Cheers.